Good afternoon, everyone. Well, afternoon, if you're on the East Coast. Um, welcome to today's Research America Alliance webinar. As you know, we will keep you on mute um, through uh, the presentation, and you can type your questions in the Q&A box at any time. My colleague, Terry Schwartzbeck, will, will ask them. I am so pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Kafwe Jaraza who is the K. Ranga Rama Krishnan Endowed Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Duke University Medical Center. He's got just a, an incredible background. Um, he was the first African-American to complete a PhD in neurobiology at Duke, where he also received an MD in his training in psychiatry. His research interest includes using neurotechnology to understand how changes in the brain produce neurological and mental illness. He serves on the advisory board for the NIH Brain Initiative. He was awarded the One Mind Institute Rising Star Award. Um, he is a popular TED Med speaker. He advised uh, the Obama administration on 21st century cures. And maybe not most importantly, but I smile because he's from Silver Spring, Maryland, which is just up the road um, for where I live. So Kaf, you mentioned to us yesterday that you've been speaking a lot recently about your experience pursuing a career in science and your diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So we are looking forward to you sharing with us your thoughts about the intersection between these two and how we in the research advocacy world can build a path where diversity, equity, and inclusion are intrinsic um, rather than aspirational attributes, not only in our field, but uh, in society at large. So Kaf, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for having me here. Um, it is quite an honor and thank you for the introduction, Jenny. I, I've really been marinating and, and meditating this month being Black History Month and thinking a lot about everything going on in our country now, um, as well as our not so distant history. And, and in part of my thoughts, I've really been thinking about one of the great civil rights heroes that we lost last year, uh, John Lewis. And I, I've been you know, having represented the fifth congressional district in, in Georgia um, since 1987. And, and I've been thinking a lot um, and watching a lot of videos um, and reading some correspondence. And there was a story that has just, uh, really struck with me um, that he told. And he had recently won um, an award for a book. And he was talking about his love of books. And I was thinking a lot about his experience growing up in Alabama. Some of my dearest mentors uh, grew up in Alabama around the same time as well. And thinking about the experience that was articulated growing up in segregated schools. And the idea there that while they were books, um, the books were different than the books in schools for the white children because of segregation. And this idea that someone with a love for books grew up in a time period where the educational framework led to what we would call hand-me-down books. Now, as, as many people know, uh, he would go on to be the youngest speaker at 23 at the March on Washington. And in, in, in thinking about his life and legacy, someone whose career started with these, uh, these secondhand books and how it evolved, I, I started to think a lot about my experience as a black man in science and medicine um, and myself at 23 years old. I had uh, just come down, moved down to North Carolina, my first trip um, to the South. Maryland is technically parts of it below the Mason-Dixon line, but I learned North Carolina is really the South. And, and, and I remember being in uh, medical school and my graduate training in neurobiology. And it was, a, it was a time that was different than now, you know, having now sat through an incredibly difficult year in the world, seeing the devastation um, that COVID-19 has wreaked on the world, um, over 400,000 individuals dead um, and with uh, individuals from communities uh, Black and Hispanic communities being two to three times more likely to die. And it, it was a much more hopeful time back then for me in science, 
we weren't too far away from having uh, discovered what we call the human genome. So this is the pattern of all the, the DNA base pairs that were thought to hold the key to human life. Um, and, and, and growing up and, and coming up in medicine at the time, and in my training as a scientist at the time, what brought so much hope to the discovery of the human genome was that we, as scientists and clinicians, thought that we would be able to de develop therapies and cures that weren't simply based on giving somebody a medication, but more so understanding everything about that individual and tailoring medications and treatments directly towards them. The idea of precision medicine. So instead of medicine based on using a hammer, medicine based on using a scalpel. So this was an incredibly hopeful, hopeful time. And you know, at, 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 at that time, I got interested in the area of psychiatry and the brain. And my hope was that the, these, this genome revolution or this movement towards precision medicine would allow us to identify genes um, that gave risk for devastating mental illnesses, illnesses like depression or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, and uh, degenerative, neurodegenerative illnesses such as Alzheimer's as well. And, and the reason why I was so hopeful that medicine and science would deliver these cures was because my family members are deeply impacted by these psychiatric illnesses. And so it was a hopeful time for me. I went into science hoping that as these discoveries came about, I would be able to develop and deliver cures to folks suffering in this country, including my very own family as well. But I, I think in much the same way that I began thinking and meditating on our brilliant civil rights hero, John Lewis, I think what happened at that time was I realized as a young scientist and budding clinician that there was something else going on in this country and there was something else going on in the medical academic arena. And it was that as we were developing what would become known as this precision medicine initiative, it was being developed in a way that would ultimately lead to what I call hand-me-down science, hand-me-down cures, and ultimately hand-me-down health outcomes for individuals uh, who are Black or Hispanic. And I'll, I'll explain what I, I mean by that, right? Um, if you think about the human genomic architecture, many of the studies that were being done at the time, they were essentially largely populated by individuals of European ancestry. And when I use the answer term ancestry, what I mean by ancestry is it is the pattern of how your genes have moved through the world over time. So thinking about where your genes were um, 10 generations ago, right? Genes both reflect where we are now, but it reflects the history of human migration and where our genes came from and how they moved through human society across time. And as I, I, these large scale studies began to come out that were finding patterns of genes that gave risk for schizophrenia um, and gave risk for bipolar disorder and autism, what was disturbingly clear was that these studies didn't have a substantial number of individuals from African ancestry. I don't like using the word exclude, but in studies of 100,000 of people, there weren't anybody in there of African ancestry. And this was a quite personal thing for me. As, as I mentioned, you know, one might have hope in the opportunity to develop new treatments and cures and as this precision medicine initiative was building. But as I mentioned, I had individuals in my family members, uh, individuals in my family who I wanted to deliver treatments and cures to as well. And so here I was watching this enterprise develop in a way that would ultimately lead to much the same experience that John Lewis had had. Um, it's what I would term secondhand cures, uh, secondhand research and ultimately secondhand health outcomes. And you can really appreciate this um, if you to take these patterns um, that are found in these large scale genomic studies and then try to apply these patterns um, that were developed on individuals of European ancestry to folks of African ancestry. And they don't have anywhere near the same utility, clinical predictive power at all. And one might say, one might ask the question, so how do we end up in this place where certainly during earlier times in our history, it wasn't, you know, folks who were black in this country didn't have hand-me-down anything um, until the point where we then went into segregation and there were hand-me-down books. How are we, you know, in the 21st century, still in a place where we're dealing what I would describe as hand-me-down science, hand-me-down cures, and ultimately hand-me-down differences in health outcomes? 
And I, I think one of the reasons why um, this w w happened is because we ultimately haven't always had individuals with different perspectives in the room as some of these scientific experiments and scientific pathways are being defined. It, if I was in the room, certainly, I would be asking the question, it's you know quite human question, um, how is this gonna work for my family? Let's make sure we're doing what is necessary for this to work uh, for my family, thinking about my ancestry. Now, one might wrestle with this question and say that is a horrible thing as we think about this idea of hand-me-down science, but at least we're making progress. And I always like to juxtapose when I talk about um, what the right thing is to do with what the smart thing to do in terms of yielding the best scientific outcomes for everybody. And so when I use this term ancestry in genetics, um, and you think about human migration, we all know um, that life started in the continent of Africa, and we had essentially tribes in different countries, and some of those tribes migrated out and essentially populated what would today be known as Europe um, and Asia and ultimately America. And it turns out if you look at the genomic architecture in Europe, which represents about 16% of the world, you can see differences in countries between populations in countries in Africa that are bigger than the differences between uh, ancestries in Asia and in Europe. And, and while we think about searching uh, the genomic architecture for things that give risk for disease, it actually raises an important scientific question. If you think about searching differences in genomic architecture for what might ultimately be cures or signals for resilience, and it raises this idea that perhaps the resilience pathways that are in ancestries that we can use to develop treatments that would be helpful for the other ancestries. So as this architecture around genomics is being developed, it's not just that it is yielding what I would say is secondhand science towards individuals um, from Black and Hispanic communities. It's actually going much further, and it's yielding a lesser quality of science. So how do we navigate this and, and how do we advance the field forward? And, and I mentioned one of the things that's going to be particularly important is making sure that there are scientists, scientists with unique backgrounds, unique perspectives, and unique ideas in the room when this is being generated. This idea of having diverse perspectives and experiences is something that is central, central, central to the quality of science that we're doing. As has been well appreciated, this was articulated in the American Innovation and Competitive Act of 2017, our country continues to diversify. And if you look across the academic landscape, um, despite the fact our country is 34% women, about 30% of those in STEM fields are women, 25% of the faculty in academia. And the numbers are substantially worse if you think about individuals uh, who are Black or from Hispanic communities. The numbers are more like 6.5%. So as our country becomes, to, becomes more and more diverse uh, in what we would call a majority-minority country by 2045, what this bill, this congressional bill articulated is that we need to do a much, much better job of mining talent from these individuals of different and diverse backgrounds to generate a better scientific work product. And if we don't succeed in doing this going forward, ultimately, we're going to have a country that produces less science, right? Science that continues to deliver what we call hand-me-down science to certain parts of the population. But the scientific enterprise in a whole will be harmed. And, and I think it's important to appreciate this as you think about US science in a global enterprise as well. So certainly, you know, as we can all appreciate in the last few years, there's been some global challenges around themes like intellectual property. Um, it is certainly the case that we don't have to get into intellectual property battles if none of the scientific ideas come from our country in the first place. So certainly we wanna think about how to continue to mine the talent from our population as it continues to become diverse and make sure that it can participate in the enterprise more broadly as well. And I just been thinking about this, the National Institutes of Health, um, last year, some of its important leadership, uh, Dr. Francis Collins, Dr. Larry Tabak, Dr. Helen Valentine, and others have worked together to really come up with a plan to think about how to bring more diverse minds and more diverse talent into the academic landscape by targeting faculty uh, from diverse backgrounds and those that are interested in helping to accelerate uh, diversity within our entire enterprise and landscape, these NIH first, F-I-R-S-T grants. And this initiative has really been advanced um, from a perspective of investing about $240 million over 10 years. 
But one can also appreciate um, how these efforts, although important, although timely, um, are still mismatched with regard to the need of investment to continue to advance diversity and advance what we call firsthand, uh, firsthand science uh, for black and brown communities. And I can just sort of give you a hint of this before um, I conclude and, and give way for any questions you have. If you think about that $240 million investment over 10 years, one of the uh, issues that has really come up in the scientific field of late is thinking about scientific funding, uh, particularly for those um, individuals, black individuals, black scientists in this country. And as was appreciated in a landmark scientific study in 2011, when you had black scientists applying for research grants at the NIH, there was a funding disparity. In other words, they were less likely to be funded even when you took into account account balancing to make sure that their publication record was the same, to make sure their award records were the same, and to make sure their pedigrees at the institutions they were at were the same. There was still a funding difference. And if you calculated out this, uh, this, this still accounts for about two to three grants per institute per year. And thinking about the large grants at around $3 million per year, that ends up being on the order of $75 million per year that is underinvested in Black scientists in this country per year. So that $75 million per year over 10 years is about $750 million, certainly something that while the NIH first grant is going to be closing that difference, it certainly doesn't meet the level of investment that's necessary to make sure that firsthand science um, is being done and ultimately that everybody is benefiting from the treatment and the cures that are available in this country. So I'll conclude by saying, as we look at our scientific landscape over uh, in, as is assessed in terms of our scientific literacy and science and medicine, uh, between the year 2000 and 2018, the U.S. has fallen uh, in, from being fourth to 18th in terms of science and 18th to 34th in terms of mathematics. So it's really time for our nation to be serious about investing in the next generation of scientists, figuring out how to mine, mine that diverse talent from all backgrounds and all perspectives, bring them and support them in the scientific architecture and enterprise such that we can continue to do the best science to drive the best cures for people in this country as well well as make sure that the U.S. can compete in the global scientific enterprise. So thanks for having me here, and I'm certainly willing to field any questions or thoughts that you may have. Thank you, Kof. Um, wow. Um, what, a, uh, what an incredible um, you know, testament to the power of diversity uh, in science, um, not only your own experience, but the impact on um, you know, on the health of, of people of color around the world. Um, I'm gonna kick, kick it off with a question. Um, so part of making equitable change is sometimes making people uncomfortable with the truth about institutional and systemic racism. And I just wonder how you broach those conversations, um, you know, to cultivate people to think about solutions. Um, and perhaps some of your psychiatry training comes into play as well. Thanks. Yeah, you know, I, I, I always talk about the importance of incentives, right? I'm a psychiatrist, so I believe that human nature works towards incentives. Um, secondly, I'm a neuroscience scientist, right? So I believe that bias is inherent to every brain, right? Our brains can only process so much information. Processing information in the brain uses energy. The brain uses the <laughs> half or more of the energy and oxygen that we take in. And so we learn how to take past patterns, right? Things that we observed in the past and uh, make choices Choices based on uh, future expectations. And so a lot of this begins with this idea that what we ultimately want in science um, and in most areas is for the best talent um, to be on the field, right? You can think about this in terms of any sports analogy. You get the best talent on the field, you have the best product, um, and you're able to compete. Um, to the highest extent. And what is important to articulate from that standpoint is really ask this fundamental question, if we as scientists um, and we, uh, those in government and those in industry actually believe that intellect is what I call universally distributed. In other words, is intellect sort of sprinkled evenly across the population? 
if you walked and you, you really wrestled with that question and you believe that the answer was yes, I believe int intellect is universally distributed, and you walked into a room or a company and all men were there, and you were not challenged to say, well, where are the women, <laughs> right? It means you actually don't believe that intellect is universally distributed because you can't believe that you have the best product in front of you if you haven't sampled from it. So I, I always start um, with um, that sort of framing, right? Um, does one believe that question? If one doesn't believe that question, that there's not much uh, conversation to continue. That is a scientific perspective uh, that I'm certainly not powerful enough to move. But if it is powerful to, if, if that is one's perspective, then one must ask then the question, I'm a scientist, so I ask questions. Well, how did it end up like this? And then one is forced to wrestle with history, right? We are a function of that which came before. Society didn't start. Um, society didn't start yesterday or the day before. And you know, some in science, you know, we've been led to believe that everything is fair and everything's equal, and there's no systemic racism. And I always ask the question: Well, did you believe there was systemic racism in the United States? And they say, yes, of course, absolutely. The U.S. has a history uh, that is linked with systemic racism. And then I ask the fundamental question. Or when did it end? And when I find that folks cannot answer the question that it ended, then it's reasonable to believe that it still exists when you see differences, um, for example, as the NIH funding rate gaps. And if those differences are a function of systemic racism and that um, that is bad for the outcome of science and medicine, then you can create targeted solutions to create outcomes that are more equitable because you know that systemic racism was there and you cannot identify when it ends. So I think that's the way that I tend to frame the conversation and discussion. I'm gonna um, ask one more and then turn it over to my colleague, Terry, for audience questions. Um, you wrote an open letter um, last year and which was just so heart-wrenching, moving, compelling. And then you also uh, gave part of it on, on YouTube. Um, were your colleagues surprised by your own personal experiences of racism in the academic institution? And what, what was that like for you? How, how did it move the conversation along? Yeah, so I, I can say I got colleagues, uh, I got letters and emails and thoughtful responses, not only from colleagues um, at my own institution, but across the country, right? From folks who have been on the Brain Initiative uh, with me, giving me really thoughtful messages. I'm actually giving a talk uh, for Caltech this evening uh, because a colleague reached out and wanted to know um, what he can do to continue to change the ecosystem where he was. It was, um, I, I'm, I'm a scientist um, and I love writing. It is the most excruciating thing I've ever written in my life. <laughs> It is the first time I've actually shed a tear <laughs> putting words down on paper. I've gotten many of bad grant reviews and paper <laughs> reviews from journals. Uh, none of them have ever uh, moved me to tears before. But I thought it was really important. You know, I'm a psychiatrist and I, I believe that, you know, human beings have an ability to feel other people's emotions and they're called empathy. And when you experience actually walking in somebody's shoes and knowing what it's like to day to day, then you want to do whatever is necessary to minimize the pain that you feel because you've experienced what it's like to be in their situation and in their shoes. So I, I, I did what, you know, at the time I realized was a really risky thing, right? Change always brings about counter change, right? There is no reaction without an equal and opposite reaction. And, and I appreciated that those um, in the arena, not everyone would feel that um, what I was saying had merit or value um, and that some, it would make some extremely uncomfortable. But I think it was a really important thing to do, not only for the sake of advancing all the stories and narratives that my trainees and my colleagues were sharing, but I really wanna drive this country to be better. Right? I want the best cures, the best outcomes, the best research to happen. And in order to do that, I have to be part of the catalyst to drive that outcome. Thank you, Kaf. Well, we've got a, a number of audience questions now. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Terry Schwartzbeck to uh, pose those. Sure thing, thanks, Jenny. And uh, just a reminder to folks, you can type your questions into the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to start with just sort of a broader question that we've gotten. Um, in your opinion, you know, can you talk about what's worked well policy-wise to actuate these DEI initiatives and research? You know, so much of what we do, we can learn from what's working well. Yeah. So I, I think um, when one thinks about diversity and inclusion, there are examples of things um, that have certainly worked well. And you know, I, I always love giving a personal shout out to <laughs> growing up in Maryland and being at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. 
And it's an example of, you know, when I went to this undergraduate program, I was in the eighth year of scientists, uh, young undergraduates coming through with a goal of creating more PhDs in um, the scientists. So going, thinking about diversifying, diversifying science more broadly. And if there's anybody here and you appreciate how long it takes to get a PhD in the sciences, <laughs> um, no PhDs had been awarded when I got there. I was in the eighth year. Um, it started off in the first year being targeted to all black males in the second year opened up to females and in the eighth year it opened up to all people of all races and backgrounds interested in bringing more diversity and equity to the scientific enterprise and um, uh, about maybe a year and a half ago it was now this program at the University of Maryland Baltimore County had become the number one producers of African Americans getting MD PhDs in the sciences it's been a raving success um, that program uh, was picked up by HHMI or the Howard Hughes Medical Institute they showed then that they could replicate the program at other universities, uh, UNC, so University of North Carolina. I'm a Dukie, so uh, that's the only shot out that they will get today, <laughs> and Penn State. And since um, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative has also worked on replicating this program at Berkeley and some other schools in California as well. So I think there are, there are plenty of examples in which focused effort can yield outcomes. But as you can see, it takes a while, right? Um, to, to really drive diversity in the sciences, um, we need to figure out how to connect early career sciences, early career, early career individuals interested in science with the later outcomes. There are things that are being immediately done. I mentioned the NIH first program. Um, and then the, certainly the administration has called, you know, for federal agencies to look through their portfolio, figure out where any indications of uh, systemic racism might exist and provide targeted solutions. And this is certainly an area that I've been working on with some of my colleagues as well. And hopefully some of those recommendations will be out shortly as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question that's come in from someone who is a professor and uh, founding director of, uh, of an institute who says we've recruited a very diverse and talented faculty and staff um, and many are in the early stage of their career. So as their supervisor, what should this person keep in mind while mentoring them in terms of equity and inclusion? Yeah, so I, I think um, one, to articulate the idea that um, those young faculty and staff have something really important to uh, contribute to the field. I, I always say um, science um, is an incredibly awesome, amazing field that is built with a lot of what we in science called negative reinforcement. <laughs> in other words, a lot of critique, right? There's a lot of critique that comes along with grants and publications, and the goal is to make science better. And, but, and you know, a lot of what is, uh, has been fundamental to scientific training historically is to teach people how to deal with and navigate critique and an incredible amount of adversity. And I always say, you know, if you're from a diverse background and you grew up in the United States, you are substantially more likely to have learned to deal with adversity before hitting the scientific arena. And what's necessary in that case is to balance, actually balance with an incredible amount of affirmation. And the reason why this is important, you know, folks have recently gone through, this is a, a study out of Stanford, uh, a, a group that does what's called machine learning. In other words, they can look at large amounts of data. They, they did um, what I call one of the more innovative studies um, that I've seen in some time. They basically took all of the PhDs awarded in STEM fields in the United States over the last 40 years. And they came up with a set of algorithms that basically read, use computers to read the words in the thesis and then track over time how the ideas in the thesis ultimately um, changed the fields that individuals were in. And those uh, scientists found two things that really struck me. The first one was that those from diverse backgrounds were more likely to do what they were call innovations. In other words, they were likely to have themes that were not the themes that were currently in their field. And then secondly, the one that, uh, that, that poses a real challenge to US science is that those from diverse backgrounds, if they innovated, their innovations were less likely to be incorporated into the field. And as a psychiatrist, I sort of think about this in two really clear, fundamental, and, and simple ways that you can sort of see in every high school class, right? <laughs> there are in-groups and there are out-groups. And the in-groups tend to think more similarly uh, because, you know, scientists are taught to think in the way that other scientists think. So those from in-groups tend to think more similarly. 
And those in the out group, even though they think differently, the in group tends to adopt their ideas left. So these are just normal human functions that we see in many arenas. But you can appreciate how bad this is for advancing innovation and bringing new ideas into the scientific enterprise. So I think it's really important for you as a mentor and as a guide to provide an incredible amount of, uh, of affirmation to encourage those young scientists who think differently to pursue ideas and challenge the current paradigm that they're in. One of the young scientists that I've been um, so pleased with, uh, she finished uh, her postdoctoral training in my lab, Raybo Holtman, and we spent a lot of time in her postdoctoral training, getting her to really dig into the ideas, um, no matter what negative feedback there might be from the field, really standing and believing and pursuing those ideas that are likely to have a huge impact. And I'm really pleased that in the last year, she's won uh, NIH's, one of their most competitive awards for young scientists in innovation, the new, the NIH New Innovator Award. And she's also received an incredible amount of support uh, from private foundations as well. And one of the things that makes me so proud of Rainbow, uh, she's at the University of Iowa at their Neuroscience Institute. She's actually just appointed as their chair of diversity and inclusion for the Institute. And one of the things she articulated in this and why she's so perfectly suited for the role is that she understands that diversity actually produces a better scientific outcome. And she was able to articulate that to that to them. And they appreciated that if they wanted the best scientific work product, they needed to bring in somebody who who knew how to create an ecosystem where diverse talent could thrive and contribute to the broader system. Great, great. thanks. Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, you, you go, Terry. Okay, great. Um, so you've touched on this a little bit, but are there other things, other roles that an ally can play in this setting in, in racial and ethnic and gender equity? Other things that allies should be thinking about? Yeah, so this this is a this is a simple um, and straightforward one, particularly in, in the biomedical arena, and we can all appreciate this, having sat in a pandemic in the last year, right? Our behavior and our health com outcomes affects each other, <laughs> right? And so, if individuals get sick in the context of a virus, they pass the virus on, and our country is more likely to be sick um, in a way that impairs ultimately economic outcomes. If individuals are not vaccinated, the virus can continue to mutate in ways that even those that have the privilege to get vaccinated um, are left more susceptible in the future, right? So we are all part of a unique enterprise. And I encourage people, even when they're thinking about being allies, to recognize that it is a very selfish thing. And it's okay <laughs> to be part of a selfish thing, to want everybody to do better and to be healthier. If we actually believe that human intellect is universally distributed, you're not simply an ally by making science more diverse, you are actually helping to come up with treatments and cures that are more likely to help you um, and your family members as well by bringing more talent into the workforce. One of the, the greatest examples of this, and, and, and I'm totally humbled by this, um, someone else in the Meyerhoff program, um, she was several years behind me, Dr. Corbett, who's at the NIH um, and has played such a central role in the development of the vaccine that many of us uh, are getting injected into our arms right now. And so I think it's just very clear that this idea of, of promoting a diversity and inclusion in science is to produce a better work product in a way that actually makes us all more healthy. It's not simply about being an ally. We are advocating for the outcomes and the improved performance of our entire nation, which benefits and lifts all of us. Terry, shall I uh, jump in with a question? I think we're we're running close to our time, uh, Kaf, and I know you uh, you have many demands on your time. Um, you know, some people are calling this past year a time of racial reckoning. I mean, I think mainly as a as a white person, my sense is that basically it's a time when white people are being forced to confront on a much more daily, regular basis um, that the uh, structural racism that exists in, in our society. Um, but there, are, there is good that's coming out of this period, right? Um, how do we maintain that over time? So for example, you know, we see a lot more interest in, um, among black scientists in being involved in public policy, you know, hashtag black side Paul, um, just a lot of energy you know, how do we, how does Research America, how do others um, in our alliance, you know, help to sustain 
sustain this momentum um, over time because it's um, it's exciting to see what's happening. But how do we how do we keep it going? Yeah, I I, I always say um, as a psychiatrist that sadness and pain can be activation energy for change, right? And particularly when that sadness and pain is experienced and shared by those with the power to promote change, right? Given the history of this country, um, power uh, has not always uh, been universally distributed, right? It has been associated with uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds. So I think we're in a window when that power and pain is shared more broadly to sit, to listen. Um, there's scientists that have been working on these issues for one, some time, right? After I um, uh, wrote the piece around my personal experiences. I then published a second piece that articulated how I'd been thinking about this issue for a long time. And um, easy, straightforward solutions that could be applied within the legal and government framework to bring about change. So I think what's really necessary is to, is to realize some of this change first requires us um, accepting and acknowledging that there's say, systemic racism in the enterprise, right? Um, that changing and addressing those require targeted solutions, right? So if there's systemic racism, dealing with systemic racism is not racist, right? Like, um, and it is okay to be anti-racist in a targeted way to address challenges that are there in a way that can make things better uh, for our country. And, and I think, you know, I, I certainly think that one can appreciate beyond the, the deaths of COVID-19 um, and George Floyd, one can certainly appreciate the tipping point uh, that our country is in if we don't deal with these things immediately. Having sat there, um, I was scheduled to give a talk on January 6th and having, you know, trying to clear my mind and watching some TV before my talk at 7 p.m., I, I was left at the end of the day saying that if we don't figure out how to deal with this issue now, um, it is one that has the potential to tear, tear our entire framework of democracy apart, right? We cannot um, thrive and live and believe in democracy while simultaneously accepting the fact that everyone is not equal and that these differences exist. So with all things, um, I say it's not simply about being an ally. It's actually about fighting for all of our interests because it makes things better for all of us. And I think this is a unique time and opportunity um, with a level of awareness where we can start to generate targeted solutions for the problems that we've identified. Uh, if I can just uh, raise one more audience question, which I think a lot of us have perhaps been thinking about, but this person says, you know, yes, I believe in equality of intellect, but there's never been equal opportunity in education. So how do we get black and brown people into research if they haven't had opportunities in basic science? Yeah, so it, it's fascinating. This is why I started off um, and I really wanted to highlight that funding disparity gap um, in the NIH funding, right? Because this, what this suggests is that even if you can take somebody and get them through those differences in early education investment, and you can get them through the differences in college graduation, right? The majority of Americans don't graduate the college degree, and you can figure out how to get them through graduate school or medical school, right? With an equal award profile, an equal publication profile, and being appointed at equal universities, they're still bias baked in the system. And so uh, while I think we do need to target change to the entire enterprise. I think one of the most egregious things we can see is even those that we've figured out how to get them, that resilient group all the way through, they're still running into these differences that are almost baked into a federal institution. So I, 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 I've made the case that we should think about targeting those first. And the reason why that's important is because then that group can serve as role models to encourage the group after them, to encourage the group after them. And, and so I think we have to do all of these things, but they're things that we certainly must do immediately. Uh, thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon. You know, your insights, your, your message, um, uh, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot, lot to work on um, and uh, a lot to, um, yeah, we have a lot to get done, uh, but we're so lucky to have you um, willing to play a leadership role uh, in this area. So thank you so much. Um, we'll let you get back to your research or <laughs> to another, um, another audience. Um, we've posted your letter um, so folks can get it. And um, there are lots of great videos if people want to hear Kaf talk about his research, which is incredible, and lots of other topics. So thank you so much.
and for joining you for us. Me here. Um, happy Black History Month, everybody. Yes, <laughs> happy Black History Month. Um, and to our audience, um, just a reminder that next week on the 16th at 1 p.m., we'll have John Burklow, who's the Associate Director for Communications and Public Liaison at NIH. And he's gonna talk about NIH's priorities for this year uh, as the agency advances research efforts aimed at COVID and other deadly and debilitating health threats and also contends with issues like cybersecurity breaches. So um, I know we're gonna learn a lot from John next week. Thank you all. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in the future.